Okay, I see. Once you start screaming, okay. Ah, oh, you set up a timer. Yeah, so you let that just look at right. Yeah, okay. The first few days, I kept signaling the Terry. <laughs> so how 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 long is this interview supposed to be? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's one hour, is huh? Is that okay? Yes, fine, fine. Uh, most of our interviews have gone over. Over, If you're huh? willing to keep talking, we can keep talking. <laughs> I can talk forever about Singapore politics. And it's so rare to get the opportunity to talk about, you know, have an honest conversation. Yes. Are we live? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and okay. welcome back to the TOC live elections uh, live stream, elections talk show with me, PJ Thumb, and I'm looking at this camera right here. <laughs> um, and uh, today we have a very interesting guest with us, Mr. Lim Tian, Secretary General of the People's Voice Party. Welcome to the show, Mr. Lim Tian. PJ. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you for having me and. Um, I hope you know you find what I have to say in the next hour interesting. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I've got a lot of questions for you right here. But let's start with the one question that everyone wants to know and that everyone is really curious about. Why does people's voice have no apostrophe in it? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we decided on, I mean, so uh, when we formed. Decision. It was a conscious decision. We decided on it at the formation of the party, and we decided that you know we can we can have many types of people represented in the party, right? And so it is for unity rather than to say that there are different factions, and so there must be an apostrophe, all right, to to describe it. But um, I do not know whether maybe it was for purposes of branding or whatever, but we decided to do away with that apostrophe. Oh, okay, because apostrophe merely implies possession. So you could do people's s apostrophe voice. Yes. Right. So yes. you have a multitude of people who possess a voice, but you have no apostrophe. We have no apostrophe, <laughs> but you know there is also a word people's. Um, yeah. Uh, you know there, there there is such a word in the English language which yes. describes uh, various groups of people. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. Uh, if, if any of you out there intend to vote for People's Voice, please resist the temptation to put an apostrophe on People's, uh, because that might be considered spoiling your vote for some reason. <laughs> Just put the X where you want to put, next to the party you want to vote for. And don't forget, your vote is secret, right? I keep repeating that every day. I'm going to repeat it again every day that I'm on air until the election. Uh, yes, but to come back to you, sir. So, um, I think you've had a very interesting career. You've been in opposition politics for, for what, a while now? Uh, this is not your first time as an opposition candidate. So another question is, you actually were already Secretary General of the NSP. Why leave a party that you were running and then start another party where you occupy the same leadership role? Uh PJ, let me tell you a bit about my entry into politics. Okay. And I think one day I would like to write a book because I came into politics in the most amazing way, if I could put it that way. I have always been interested in politics ever since I was a young boy. Mm -hmm. And I actually come from quite an establishment background in the sense that my father was part of the establishment. Executive my, Director of the People's Association. Yes, my father was the Executive Director of the People's Association in the late 1970s. Yeah. He was the Executive Director of the People's Association when the PAP lost Anson in 1981. Oh, right. And um, I have always told that story to Kenneth G. R. Adnam, and he loves it. <laughs> and, uh, and my uncle was also my mother's brother was also a, a top civil servant and he was um, in the HDB, URA and then you know with PDEMCO, um, the precursor to a capital land. Mm -hmm. So um, I think people were quite amazed when uh, I you know chose my lot with the opposition. But to cut the long story short, I hunkered down, I 
in my early days, I practiced the law, mm -hmm. but subconsciously, I always knew that there might be a time when um, I would go into politics in Singapore. And after 2011, I did join the NSP, mm -hmm. but I did nothing, absolutely nothing for four years. And in the meantime, I was in Indonesia uh, building up a mining company, and I even practiced law for in Indonesia for two years. But when LKY died in 2015, right. the president of NSP, Sebastian Teo, came knocking on my door and said, Lin Tian, we would like you to run in the upcoming elections. And I had just started a law practice in uh, Indonesia, and I was not ready. But uh, one thing led to another. I started walking the ground with the NSP, and then the journalist picked me out as a new candidate. And one thing led to another. When Hazel Pua resigned as Secretary General of the NSP very close to the election, uh, I was shocked when the party decided to appoint me as the Secretary General. I never attended a single meeting in my... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that, that is how I entered politics. Right. Yeah. That doesn't actually give me a lot of confidence in the party's decision making to appoint someone who doesn't come to meetings as their yeah. leader. Okay, well, uh, I mean, um, that's, okay, that's a very interesting story. But then why leave the NSP and start People's Voice? I think, uh, well, I had a very good two years with the NSP. Yeah. You know, I, I have a lot of uh, respect for the people there. And, you know, uh, people like Sebastian, Reno, and uh, Spencer, whom I know very well, are candidates in this election. Um, but at some point in time, I felt that there was a divergence in our political views. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the NSP is quite a traditional party. It uh, will, uh, it, 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 it does not look upon with favor, I think, when the Secretary General starts going off to Hong Lim Park to give speeches, which I mm -hmm. started to do, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I think Hong Lim Park is an important um, uh, part of Singapore's political culture or has become and uh, I intend to continue doing that right and uh, so I thought that there was a divergence in political ideology um, and I decided to leave and form my own party okay I'm, I'm very interested then about what you what is the people's voices political ideology uh, especially since you guys as far as I know correct me if I'm wrong you haven't issued a manifesto so what, what does the People's Voice stand for? What do you believe in uh, PJ, as a party? We, ha we are about to release our manifesto. Oh, good. Okay. We may do it uh, either this evening or tomorrow morning. Okay. And I intend to uh, make a video to uh, right. introduce the manifesto. Um, of course, many other parties released it before the elections. We yeah. chose to hold back, but, uh, you know, for strategic purposes. And you know in England, um, for example, in Britain, parties don't normally release their manifestos until the election campaign has gone underway. So that is the timing we have chose. Right. As far as the ideology is concerned, our ideology is very simple. Okay. I think it is about putting people first and making Singapore our home again. And if I may put it, there is a third message, which I think is very important as well. And it is for Singaporeans to regain their dignity, their country, and their future. Because I think the pendulum has swung too far the other mm -hmm. way over the last two decades, where under the PAP narrative, it has always been this talk about being open. We are not, we are not against Singapore being open. Let me make that very clear. Right. We know Singapore's position in the world. And I, for one, have always been proud of the fact that Raffles founded us and made us into a free port. Okay. And that is how we have thrived. But I think when that narrative goes too far and you start devaluing that Singapore citizenship and you start telling the Singaporean that, look here, you know, you've got to compete with 3.5 or 4 billion other Asians who are allowed to come in to you know, work in Singapore, mm -hmm. I think that is unfair. And okay. uh, I do not think that 
a first world nation should do that to its citizens. I have lived in many countries before. I have lived in Britain. I have lived in Indonesia. I don't think that there's another comparable first world nation where it is so easy for a foreigner to come in and displace a local Singaporean. Okay. And that is what I am against. Okay, let's, let's break that down. What exactly do you mean when it is easy? Um, so you, you fundamentally, it seems what you're arguing is that the situation in Singapore is unfair to locals yes. uh, and that it is easy for foreigners to come in and displace, uh, to use your words, Singaporeans, especially in jobs. Yes. Right. But I think that would be very much denied by the government. And if you look at the debate that, uh, you know, from a few days ago, they specifically said, you know, so many foreigners have lost their jobs um, and that um, Singaporeans, they do put Singaporeans first. So can you, can you tell us in practical terms, like what you mean in terms of specific policies where you're arguing that the government and its rules are unfair to Singaporeans? PJ, for example, take the, the situation of our PMETs. Right. All right. I mean, the best estimate at the moment is that there are about 100,000 Singaporean PMETs who have been retrenched, who have lost their jobs. All right. Okay, the government has denied that number, right? It said yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot lower than that. Well, let's, yeah, you, you know, they can deny. I, I think, you know, that is the number that has been bandied around. Okay. And I think COVID-19 may lead to a further 200,000 jobs being lost. Okay. Now, I think the government has a duty to its citizens to make sure that well-paying jobs go to Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. It is another issue, it is another question altogether if Singaporeans are not well qualified for those jobs. But I do not believe that to be the case. I think for too long, and you know, I have been hearing the same narrative repeated for the last three decades. I'm 55 this year, and I'm old mm -hmm. enough to remember what was the narrative in the 80s and in the 90s, mm -hmm. that our economy is restructuring, that Singaporeans have to keep reskilling, upgrading. Right. And I look around me, and I no longer drive, and I choose not to drive. I choose to take public transport, to take taxis. And I hear the horrible stories from taxi drivers, mm -hmm. how they were once in the managerial roles and how they were displaced, how they lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the 2015 uh, elections, I was involved in the televised debate. And I said that Singapore has the best educated taxi drivers in the world. And mm -hmm. it's true. I mean, I speak to some mm -hmm. of them and I can't even hold a candle to them, you know, mm -hmm. as far as what they know. And I think it is criminal. It is criminal when, how can a country and the government allow such highly qualified people to be driving taxis when they should be in, um, in much better jobs? Mm -hmm. And you are allowing a foreigner to come in and do those jobs? Are you telling me that that foreigner is better qualified than the Singaporeans we have? There may be some situations where I agree that Singaporean may not have the skills, the qualifications, but I think those are situations which are far and few in between. So I make no apology. I make no apology when I say that I want the best jobs to go to Singaporeans. I want to give priority to Singaporeans, which is why it is a major plank in my party's position, and which will appear in our manifesto very shortly, mm -hmm. that we are going to freeze the issuance of all new S passes, and we are going to significantly reduce the number of employment passes. Right, but that is going to severely hamper um, the sort of flexibility of companies which might, especially in areas where Singapore might have a shortage of skilled labor, wouldn't it? If, if, say, you know, Singapore is a shortage in a specific field that requires specialized labor, um, and Singap there aren't enough Singaporeans to do that, a blanket freeze is not going to help Singaporean employers who need people in that specific field. Well, I think, you know, we are not saying that the 
the foreigners who presently hold S passes, yeah. you know, be, be retrenched. We are not saying that. We are okay. saying that there must be a freeze okay. on the issuance of new S passes. Okay. And I think there must be mechanisms in place for the transfer of knowledge and skills to Singaporeans. I lived for many years in Indonesia. And you know, Indonesia being an archipelago and having at least 276 million people yeah. has less than 100,000 foreign employees in the whole country. And Indonesia insists on the transfer of skills and knowledge. Yeah. I think we must have that in Singapore. Right. We must have that. I think that can be... I do not see how employ, employers can be mm -hmm. drastically of, affected because I think that there are already enough foreigners in jobs at the moment in the critical areas. And if there are going to be more job opportunities, we want the transfer of knowledge and skills to Singaporeans. Okay, but shouldn't like businesses be able to make those decisions for themselves? You create a level playing field and the, the fact that Singaporeans are here already, that we don't require you know, all this paperwork to come into the country, then, uh, and then you say, okay, we treat people fairly, Right, but then you let businesses, rather than an overwhelming the hand of the government again, right? It's 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 sort of a, the same uh, authoritarian mentality of the PAP, isn't it? To just impose this idea of a freeze rather than let businesses decide for themselves who they want to employ and the skills that they need, and look at the people on offer. PJ, you know, yeah. I think the pendulum really has swung too far the other way. Okay. I think over the years, um, despite what the PAP has said, what we have found is that there have been so many loopholes in our labor regulations. They have come up with this thing called the fair consideration framework, which to me is not fair. It's not fair to Singaporeans. And we know of so many instances where employers have taken advantage and hired cheaper foreign labor mm -hmm. and not given fair consideration to that Singapore employee or potential Singapore employee. And I think we must make a stand. We, 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 we must make a stand and we must tell employers, enough is enough, you must employ Singaporeans. And that must be the first priority. Right. I have to say, I'm very skeptical of, of any government which says you must do something, right? Because as someone, I mean, we've both been on the receiving end of governments which tells you must do something. And there are many cases where that something is not necessarily the best for us in a given situation, but it's what they think is best. And uh, this sort of authoritarian approach is, is something I'm very skeptical about. I, and and that's, that's what I was getting at my previous question. Isn't this so your policy disagrees with the PAP, but it seems like your approach is very PAP in the sense of I'm going to tell all of you what to do rather than let you decide for yourself. You see what I'm saying? Well, PJ, I, I respect your view yeah. on, on that. Uh, I do not think I'm being authoritarian at all in, okay. in this regard. I think I want to protect the interests of that Singaporean worker. I have had so many encounters with parents in the last few years. Parents who have had to spend a lot of money educating mm -hmm. their children. Some even sending them overseas. And then when their children come home to Singapore, mm -hmm. they are not able to find jobs. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that there is any duty, or I, I, in fact, I think that is a dereliction of duty on the government's part when foreigners are able to come into Singapore, easily find jobs, and when our locals are basically priced out of the job market. And, and mm -hmm. in fact, the whole infrastructure of the jobs market, I think, must be reviewed. And, and why are locals priced out? It is because of things like CPF. It is because of things like you know, local men have to serve NS, have got to go into his service. Mm -hmm. All these mitigate against them in a competition against the foreigners. Mm -hmm. And that is something, what I call 
the neoliberal PAP, right. you know, will not take cognizant of. Because in the eyes of the PAP, the only thing is profit. And I do not care if at the end of the day, the interests of my citizens are sacrificed. Okay. Uh, there's several things I want to pick up there. I think the first thing is we talk about citizens being priced out, right? So one um, strong criticism I think that has emerged, especially out of the recent crisis, is really the, the problem is not foreigners, right? The problem is that we have a situation where labor rules are not being enforced, where uh, things are not fair because they're structurally there is no, for example, no collective bargaining on the behalf, on, on, you know, on the part of workers. Or rather, technically there is, but the trade union is government controlled, right? Yes. Where workers do not have strong protections, um, where there's no minimum wage, and there's been discussion in this election, for the first time, I think, there's actually a discussion of universal basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, my question then is, what is your... Um, how would you address these, these broader structural issues of the economy uh, such that the system is fair to all workers and gives all workers protections and um, a fair shake? You see, PJ, yeah. I, my view is this. I think that we have a government that has been hopeless in, create, in the creation of jobs. It has been. Mm -hmm. All right. It keeps running the narrative that well, you know, because of the uh, technological revolution, you know, they are going to be, yes, people are going to be displaced, you're going to have to reskill and all that. It's very simple. You are asking a lot of people to go for upgrading, for reskilling, but where is the assurance that at the end of the day, the jobs are going to be there? Mm -hmm. All right? There is absolutely no assurance at all. And the second point is this, they refuse to countenance, they, they refuse to even acknowledge that there must be some leveling off of the profit-making side of enterprise to take care of the interests of the Singapore worker, right. the Singapore citizen. That I will not stand for, because I think that the role of government, one of the most important roles of government, is to make sure that that citizen's interest is taken care of. That means that citizen has a fair shake at getting the jobs that are available in the economy. And if you have come to a stage where you are unable to create enough jobs, right. well, then I don't think you have the right to keep bringing in foreigners to take up those jobs and leaving your local citizens jobless. But you do accept that worker protection should apply to all workers, right? Both foreign and local. And that foreign workers should also be treated fairly and have the right to collectively bargain, have the right to protections. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I think that that is why NTUC is such a fuss. All right, yeah. because I think NTUC yeah. is a is a farce. You know, uh, this so-called tripartite uh, arrangement is a farce. And uh, I will allow independent trade unions because I think trade unions are important for the protection of workers' rights. I will allow. In fact, I will mandate a minimum wage okay. because one of the reasons why employers are now going for foreign labor is because there is no minimum wage in Singapore. Mm -hmm. If you have a minimum wage, that at least equalizes, you know, or levels the playing field somewhat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I have always been in favor of a minimum wage. Right. And I think the lack of a minimum wage is also one of the reasons why there is such gross inequality in our society. Right. So you, you, you made a very important point there about jobs, right? And you talk about the PAP government's inability to create jobs, um, middle-aged workers going for upskilling, reskilling, unable to find jobs. But 
is this focus on the job then? Um, I guess several questions. One is, how would you create jobs? Um, what would you dif do differently from the PAP? But second, is this focus on the job also part of the, the very neoliberal trap that you're talking about where um, we focus very much on this idea that the value of a person, human dignity is connected to their economic output or their ability to generate economic output and feed themselves. So we have two questions there. One is, how would you create jobs? Like, what would you do differently? And the second is a broader question about um, a, a, an economy and a welfare system that is still structured very much around the idea of the, a job, right? Whereas something like universal basic income, for example, would be, uh, you know, decouple human, basic human sustenance and dignity from the job. So, so, so two separate things there. So let's take the first one first. You're criticizing a PAP for not creating enough jobs. Yeah. What would you do differently? I, I, the, the way I would do differently is this. Yeah. For the last 40 years, we have become a state capitalist system mm -hmm. in the sense that the government has been so overwhelming. I mean, if you ask around, the knowing people will tell you the government basically controls 70% of mm -hmm. the economy. It controls this much of the economy through the GLCs or the government linked companies. And so as a result, private enterprise is really stifled in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Can I stop you right there, though? I don't think those numbers are quite right. The GLCs, from my understanding, nearly 50% of our GDP comes from foreign-owned companies. The GLCs contribute maybe around a quarter, and it's Singaporean small and medium enterprises which are uh, the other about 20%. So that's where we're being stifled, right? But to say that um, the government controls... 70% of the economy, I don't think it's quite right. It's, we have a huge dependence on foreign-owned business as well. And that is that the government doesn't have a huge amount of leverage because if you don't have foreign-owned business, you're kind of wiping out or, or threatening half the GDP. And that's the quandary that the PAP finds itself in, that they, I, I, would, I suspect they would love to have a lot more of these policies you're talking about but they themselves are terrified of scaring away foreign investment and they're so beholden to foreign investment because there's no strong local domestic capitalist class to then act as a, to give them leverage and buffer against a, a decreasing share coming from foreign companies, right? So I would, I would disagree with your assertion that the government is able to you know, exert that kind of influence over the economy. We're kind of trapped. Now, I, I would agree that, so it's, it's the, a conscious choice by the PAP over 50, 60 years that has got us into this quandary. But how do we get out of it? I, I think, uh, PJ, we, yeah. we, we, we may have differences on the figures, but you, okay. you pointed out, uh, 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 you made a very good point. Yes, I do not disagree that the foreign companies do take up a lot of space in our economy. But the remainder of that space, yes. I think, is what we can debate about. Because mm -hmm. I am saying that the remainder of the space is largely occupied by the government. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to the exclusion of truly private enterprise. Right. And what you call the private capitalist class. Yeah. You know, that I think that is where the problem is. Because... For the last 40 years, not enough attention has been paid to the promotion and the development of small businesses, right. micro-businesses. And yet, if you look at our employment figures, it is the small businesses that employ about 70% of the workforce, 65 to 70%. I think th those are the figures. Mm -hmm. What I would do very differently, mm -hmm. I would... I would really place a lot more, a lot less emphasis on government linked companies. I want to divert the attention and the resources to the promotion of the SMEs, the small businesses, the micro businesses. You look at a country like Korea, the proportion of the economy that the government linked companies take up is maybe 15%. In Japan, it is less than 10%. Mm -hmm. What I have quoted you earlier 
about GLCs taking up about 70% of the economy or you know, the, the, the space left after you discount the foreign companies. That is overwhelming in comparison to what other first world nations uh, have. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why you know, the PAP may spend tons of money every year trying to make our country innovative and creative. And we can never come up to that. We right. can never come up to that. You know, I study the uh, Global Innovation Index very carefully every mm -hmm. year. And yes, the mainstream media will say, oh, we are ranked number six or we're ranked number seven in the Global Innovation Index. But that is misleading mm -hmm. because Singapore is great when it comes to innovation input. It means how much money you actually put in to try and make yourself innovative. Right. But when you look at the output index, we are terrible. Right. We are terrible. And I think we have improved somewhat in the last couple of years. But if you check the figures three or four years back, we were in the relegation zone, I would say that. We were always in the bottom third in the index. Okay. And that's because our companies are not producing enough patents, trademarks, and it shows you, despite the amounts of money we have spent, we are not really getting very much out of it. Okay, this, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I, I, the question also then, I think, is, and innovation here is really important, a lot of the conversation in this uh, election has been as if the pandemic never happened, right? We talk, we, we've both cited figures that are pre-pandemic, and it looks like many of those jobs that have gone away aren't going to come back. Economies need to radically restructure, and of course, with the, the climate crisis looming, what you've seen in the pandemic is merely a fast-forward version of what's happening. So how would you then... Um, increase innovation in the economy to address the, the sort of incredible drastic challenge, changes and the huge challenges placed first by the pandemic and the fact that you know your fear about uh, foreign workers coming in right that may actually be solved by the fact that we can't travel anymore foreigners can't come in anymore but you still need to create jobs and then with the climate crisis we need to decarbonize the economy and Singapore, I think, a huge, was it 70% or something of our carbon is from industry? So how would you encourage innovation and decarbonization? The way I would encourage innovation and creativity is this. I think there's even more importance in placing emphasis on the small and the micro businesses. Right. I really see them as the engine of growth uh, for innovation and creativity. You know, a couple of years ago, I think Lee Sien Long went to one of the ASEAN forums or was it a world forum and he said that you know small businesses would be the main engine of uh, innovation mm. but you know what the PAP government does is totally contrary to that all right and um, our SMEs are suffering because it is difficult for them to get the credit the capital and um, I would do things very differently I would have a standalone bank for example to help them right uh, because I want to make sure that small businesses, you know, have, they have a fair chance of getting the credit and the capital they need to grow the business. I am very, very partial to small businesses because mm -hmm. I have been a businessman before. I also own a small business. <laughs> yes. yeah. And, you know, I know how difficult it is to access capital and access credit. Yeah. Uh, where's the GLCs, the government-linked companies? You know, they don't have to access capital. I mean, they literally have capital thrown at them, all right? So, and I do not see, I do not see the government-linked companies as being big innovators because when you don't have that need to hunt for capital or credit, where is there the uh, willingness to always innovate? Right. So, Okay, thanks for that. Let's let's shift gears to the to the second half of the what I raised earlier about and the, the universal basic income. Yeah, more broadly, social mobility. How would you encourage? You said you're in favor of a minimum wage. How would you encourage social mobility, especially in Singapore, where we've seen the very historically very low levels of social mobility? Uh, it peaked under I think the socialist governments of the 70s, the socialist PAP, but has steadily fallen. Right. Um, and, and 
more broadly, I talked about decoupling welfare from the job, right, and universal basic income. So inequality is one of the big issues that Singaporeans have been talking about. We saw, you know, Yuyen's book flew off the shelves. Poverty, inequality, welfare, social mobility. How would you address those? Uh, PJ, yeah. you know, a uh, couple of years ago, uh, the PAP put inequality right at the top of the list of mm -hmm. issues that it had to uh, tackle. And I still remember uh, reading Ong Yi Kang, you know, in the mainstream media saying that inequality was the top priority. And then I think about 18 months ago or thereabouts, you had Oxfam come out with that famous study that mm -hmm. placed the Singapore government in the bottom 10 in the yeah. world as far as its um, commitment to fighting inequality was concerned. And then you had uh, Josephine Teo at a forum together with Tommy Cole, where Tommy Cole was uh, lamenting the fact that Singapore does not have a minimum wage. Right. And that countries like Hong Kong and Taiwan had minimum wages. And as a result of the minimum wage, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. And you know what was Josephine Teo's answer? Josephine Teo's answer was, inequality is actually a sign of success of our economy. So, the PAP, from placing inequality as a top priority to tackle, has now backpedaled. And now you have Taman talking about social mobility, or his famous social ladder or something, right. you know, going up Company, a ladder, yeah, or, or ladder, escalator, yeah, social okay. escalator. To me, that is a joke. Because under the PAP, the social ladder, instead of going up that escalator, you are more likely to be coming down. Okay, I mean, we agree the PAP has done a terrible job, yeah. right? And we, we both are sitting here, we both uh, agree that we, this, you know, we both disagree with the PA, what PAP has done. And you wouldn't be in opposition if you agreed, but what would you do is my question. What's what I would voice? do is, is, yeah. is very different. If you study the history of uh, inequality and, and how uh, people have actually progressed through the decades, you realize that there is no substitution at the end of the day. Let's not talk about meritocracy and all that, because meritocracy or a fake notion of meritocracy mm -hmm. actually accentuates inequality. At the end of the day, when you study the history of the advanced nations, the only way you can address or you can reduce inequality is if there is proactive steps by government to redistribute wealth. Okay. And you found that happening in the government in the UK after the Second World War. The very short Labour government of Clement Attlee from 1945 to 1951 when Churchill came back as Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. For six years transformed England totally, transform the right. UK totally. National Health Service. National Health and, yeah. Service, things like that. You need to go in that direction. You need to start, you know, thinking about universal health care, universal right. education. Right. That is the only way, PJ. I mean, okay. I, if, if people come to me with a different recipe, I say that's total rubbish, all right? Because capitalism, neoliberalism, in fact, makes things worse. You are never going to be able to cut down on that inequality gap. Okay, so you're in favor of moving towards um, in, you know, wealth redistribution, universal health care, universal education, and do you address that in the manifesto that you... I have not addressed that in the manifesto because, um, but I can tell you, yeah. that is something which I think Singapore must aspire to eventually. Okay. I have not addressed that in my manifesto. I was very tempted to, but I agree this is the COVID election. Right. And I think jobs and how we go forward from here is more important. That will come. That will come because okay. universal health and universal education is the hallmark of a truly first world nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, you look at our MediSafe system or our Medicare system, it is a joke because we have 96 billion or maybe more than 100 billion now tied up in all these MediSafe schemes. I think it's 110 billion. 110 don't, don't billion. Don't quote me on that. Yes, 110 right. billion. Um, 
I think last year, Leong Zihian was telling me that the figure was 96 billion. And, you know, are you telling me that with 96 billion, you can't have universal health care? Mm. Of course you can. You can have universal health care for maybe a tenth of that. Mm. Yeah. But we are nowhere near that. And yet, you know, we are paying a substantial amount towards MediSafe. And yet, you know, when we go to hospitals, the cash outlay is still considerable. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, we did have almost virtually free universal health care in the 70s. Yes. You know, and that was dismantled, uh, especially under Go Chok Tong. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew yeah. started off as a Fabian, you yes, know, as a oh, socialist. Very much, very much. Okay, so we're going to um, take some questions, but let me just give you, I think, two, two last questions. One, you mentioned Minister of Manpower, Josephine Teo. Um, who might be the you know most uh, in terms of the pandemic definitely has come off the worst in terms of her performance, right? And you've publicly uh, called for her to be fired, and you're running directly against her. So, what what is your pitch to the voters of Jalan Besar? Why vote for you instead of her? Why vote for your team instead of her? I think I have a formidable team. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have Leong Zihian, who's a well-known financial consultant and advisor, uh, a, a person with an eagle eye for statistics, and he has spent, I don't know how many years now, probably the better part of a decade or more than a decade, analyzing government statistics. He is a master with jobs figures, with the CPF, and with things like that. I have Michael Fang, a, a medically trained doctor, and. Aslan, who is a renowned, internationally renowned Halal certifier and auditor. So I have a very capable team to run the town council and to take care of the residents' needs. And I compare that with the PAP team. Josephine Teo has got to be the greatest failure as far as the so-called 4G leadership is concerned. Mm -hmm. And she single-handedly is responsible for the huge explosion in the COVID-19 cases. As I have explained to people, the first foreign worker was infected in February. She should have known that of the great dangers that might be involved in, you know, all these densely populated foreign workers' dormitories. She took no action. She took no action for the better part of one and a half months. And today, I think we are the second place in the whole of Southeast Asia as far as the number of cases are concerned. Mm -hmm. So. I do not think that you can have confidence in Josephine Teo based on that alone. And I also ask Singaporeans to evaluate her on her performance as the manpower minister. And I think the last two years when she has been at the helm have not been happy ones for that Singaporean worker. You know, in the last quarter of 2019, three quarters of the Singaporean workers who were retrenched were PMETs. So mm. she has not been a great friend of that Singaporean employee. Okay. Uh, and I guess the last question, and this is probably the other really common question that was thing that was put to me when I say to people, I'm gonna invite Lim Kian, is this this um, the kind of rhetoric that you and the people's voice are putting up. Now we've talked about your position on uh, the economy, on immigrants, on foreign workers. Uh, but at the same time, in a, for example, in the national broadcast on the 2nd of July, the People's Voice representative had a quote, something like this, the state is like a father and a father who provides for alien children while allowing the breakfast, lunch and dinner of his own children to be stolen is a bad father. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some people have felt that this is unnecessarily xenophobic rhetoric. Other people have compared you to the kind of populist sentiments of, you know, populist politicians like, like Trump, for example, right? Um, and also, the, there's a sense that, correct me if I'm wrong, you've, you, you're very much targeting Indians because of the uh, CECA, uh, which is particularly difficult given that you're running in an area which includes Stekka, Little India, right? So. Can you address these criticisms directly? Yes. Right? People feel you're xenophobic. They don't want to vote for you because they feel you're xenophobic. Let me thank you 
PJ for that question. Let me first make myself uh, very clear. I'm totally against SAFER. All right, I'm totally against it. I think it was a stupid treaty mm -hmm. uh, negotiated, you know, in large part by Heng Sui Kiet, who was the permanent secretary in the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry at that time. It, SACA has become a one-way street where Indian nationals come to Singapore to work. But I never hear of Singaporeans going to India to work. I think the trade-off was that our big corporations could then invest in, it, in India more easily. But, you know, again, that is neoliberal thinking. Right. That is neoliberal thinking because the PAP thinks that if big corporations make money, the wealth will trickle down to the, to the small person. It has never happened. And I make absolutely no apologies for saying that I want SACA abolished. I do not even want it reviewed. I want it abolished. As for this charge that I'm xenophobic, Mm -hmm. Total nonsense. I think that my concern for the interests of the Singaporean does not equate to xenophobia. In fact, I would make the counter charge against those people who accuse me of xenophobia to say that if you do not take care of your own people, you are unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and I repeat myself, I think that the pendulum has swung too far against that Singaporean citizen. And citizenship is something that I myself and my party value tremendously. I think that citizenship must be the foundation for all democratic discourse right. in, a, in a nation. And it, it must be, because citizenship is a political status at the end of the day. And if I am a citizen, I do have obligations to the state, for example, that young man of 18 who bears arms for two years. He has his obligations to the state. But in return, the state must have obligations to him. Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't, I don't see why that is wrong. And I don't see why it is wrong for me to protect my own citizens or, or to even favor them. Mm -hmm. All right? So I completely reject the allegation or the charge of xenophobia. But isn't it a question also of how you pitch this? Because sitting here talking to you, I understand uh, and you know, to a certain extent I agree and respect your positions. Um, and you've said you don't want to discriminate against foreigners, you're not anti-foreigner, you just want to protect Singaporeans. But how you're pitching it, right? For example, SECA, right? Instead of because what you've explained makes a lot of sense, you could, uh, you could say SECA is pro-capitalist and anti-labor, right? And it is very much about the government and elites and establishment, big businesses enriching themselves at the expense of workers. But instead, what we keep hearing is that it's very much a sort of um, anti-Indian kind of message and a nativist message in how you talk about it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm a, you know, as much a victim of uh, not having investigated. And, yeah. and also the other thing, for example, is uh, when you talk about workers, right, you focus very much on, oh, I want to protect Singaporeans first, instead, again, of a message which could be, oh, I want to protect workers against exploitation by capital. I want to protect w labor, right, and give labor the rights and all workers uh, should be treated fairly against this, you know, exploitation by capital in this neoliberal, this PAP created neoliberal paradise, which that I agree with you. So, but instead, what we're hearing is things like, you know, uh, the quote I had earlier about uh, the state being a bad father, very nativist sort of sentiment, protect Singaporeans first, which in this modern world sounds very, you know, it, it, it sounds almost coded language for the sort of very scary, uh, populist, anti-immigrant, right-wing nationalist uh, movements that we see elsewhere. So isn't there a question of how you sell what you're talking about in terms of your substance seems good, but your message is scary? <laughs> Vijay, uh, 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 you know, um, 
I, I'm sorry if you think that my message is scary, but I think well, that voters as well. I, right? I am just making yeah. myself. I, I'm I'm making myself very plain. Now, let me put it this way: I am not against Indians at all. If we had a SACA or a similar treaty with China, I would have expressed exactly the same sentiments against allowing unlimited Chinese uh, workers to come into Singapore to work. And if you look at uh, treaties in Asia, I think one of the big problems, and we, we basically were played out. We were basically played out by, you know, um, not very clever uh, bureaucrats who negotiated SACA. You find that with the current negotiations with RCEP, you know, the um, Regional Comprehensive Economic Program, uh, which I think 16 Asian countries have been trying to negotiate, but failed at the end because India wanted the same provisions, you know, for its workers to be able to work in other countries like China, New Zealand, Australia, and all of them said no. All right. And so in order to salvage it, countries like Singapore and all that have said, okay, never mind. Uh, if India is not part of it, we can still be a, a minor RCEP. So I think wherever you look in the world and in Asia even, countries are always protective of their own workers. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as your pitch about labor protection, yes, you can put it that way. Mm -hmm. But I rather speak more plainly and to me, it is not even exploitation. It is not even exploitation of the, of the worker. In fact, in, I would say that lo local worker, that Singaporean worker is being disadvantaged by foreign competition. It's, it's not even exploitation by the bosses, you know. Mm -hmm. It is, frankly, he stands no chance. I mean, when, when put in competition with uh, that foreign worker for that same position. Well, wait, wait, sort of clarify, you, you're not saying that there is no disadvantage, exploitation by the government by, when by, lay, by capital. You're saying there is, right? You, you agree that there is exploitation by capital I of think labor. that there is exploitation by capital because right. in Singapore, we do not have independent trade unions, which I'm totally against. Right. All right? And also a broader network of regulations. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you're saying that the, it's foreign labor, you, we're disadvantaged with relationship foreign labor. That's but right. those rules are set by the government and capital. So your criticism is against the government, right? Not against the foreign workers, but it's against the It is the against the government, okay. yes. It is against the government. Okay. Because I, I think that under no circumstances should the government, you know, come up with a structure that uh, disfavors the local worker. Okay, okay, okay. But you and you're not. I mean, you don't feel uncomfortable with the kind of things you say being echoed by very nativist right wing movements in Europe, in America. You sound similar to them, and is that not a problem at all? PJ, I am not a right winger at all. In fact, my politics, I would say, is very much center left. Right. I mean, that that it comes is very through. much center left. Yes. So I totally reject the notion that I'm a right winger, but I think, you know, we shouldn't label. Right. And I okay. think in this modern world, um, Reagan was famous for saying, you know, you, you, you don't label yourself left or right, you know, what is important is whether you go up or down. So I want to make sure that my political position is consistent with the fact that it will always promote that Singaporean interest. And I make no apology for that. Okay, and you're not worried then about people taking you, because you see like the Republicans, they spent years bashing the establishment to win political power. And so the logical consequence of that after 20, 30 years is they elect the ultimate anti-establishment, anti-expert, you know, anti anti-science, anti-competence candidate, right? Because, and a lot of it is because Republicans spent 20, 30 years telling the people you can't trust the people in power, you can't trust the institutions, you can't trust the scientists, you can't trust the experts, they elect Donald Trump, right? You're not worried about your kind of rhetoric being taken and people running away with it to become increasingly xenophobic, whether you, because the Republicans, I think most of them didn't intend for 
for America to go down the path it has, but this is the logical consequence of taking the line it has. Are you not afraid? That I'm not afraid of that. I, I tell you why. Because my own analysis of um, political history is this. Yeah. I think that um, when the depression hit in the 1930s, and then you had Franklin Delano Roosevelt come, you know, right. and be the first um, socialist democratic president, even though he was born into great wealth and privilege. I think then that you had a narrative, you had almost the, the center-left narrative that reigned for about 40 years mm -hmm. until the 70s, yeah. when it hit the brakes and got into trouble. Yeah. And then that was when the neoliberals like Thatcher, like Reagan came about. And I think it was also about the time when Lee Kuan Yew turned from being left to extremely right. In fact, I think the PAP government is one of the most right-wing governments in the world. In All some right? ways, yeah. Yes. yeah. Definitely economically. Yes. Yeah. Economically, the sad thing is, throughout the world now, you have seen the neoliberal order collapse. Yeah. But the PAP is still clinging on to that narrative. It refuses to change. Okay. And yeah. I have always said that the problem with the PAP is, is it is trapped in, in its own model. It yeah. can get out of its own model. And, but I do not see, I do not foresee the neoliberal order surviving for even the next five years. Okay. And um, what I meant to say was this, I think that we are, the world now is coming to a new equilibrium where people have seen the disasters of neoliberalism, of extreme capitalism. People realize that putting people first, taking care of citizens, taking care of people's interests is important. We can't always be chasing after profit. And I am not afraid of how people label me. I'm very clear at the end of the day which direction I'm heading. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. I mean, uh, I, I respect you know, your, your, your position and I think we do agree on the substance of a lot of things. Let's take some questions. We have a lot of questions here. Um, wow, okay. <laughs> and they actually are on, on many of the things. Okay, so um, Vanessa Ng asks, I still don't get the specifics of what PV intends to do. What if the parties, what is the party's manifesto if elected? Now you're releasing the manifesto tonight. Yeah. Do you want to address any of that? Vanessa, thank you for that question. Let me say that in this election, our main priority is jobs. Jobs. Because we agree with the PAP when Shanmugam said, you know, this election is about jobs and COVID. I said, fine, that's what we want to talk about. Because you have been a total disaster in handling COVID. But more importantly, we have to face up to the situation of jobs. Because up to 200,000 jobs may be lost as a result of the crisis. And I do not believe in Taman's uh, argument or Heng Sui Kiat's argument about the creation of these 100,000 jobs, which I think is, is a farce. It really is. And I think it is important now that we need to take back these PMET jobs, which Singaporeans are well qualified to do. That is the centerpiece of our manifesto. Okay, cool. So we have several questions uh, along the same lines from Desmond, from Charan Bao about migrant workers. What is your position on low wage migrant worker rights? And Charan specifically says, and this reflects our earlier question, he feels you've been shitting on foreigners from, excuse our language, uh, shitting on <laughs> foreigners from the start. People want to know he, what he thinks about the men and women who build our homes, roads, buildings, keep them clean and take care of our children and elderly. I have no problems with foreign workers in that category because I do acknowledge that we may need them in large numbers, all right? Uh, what I'm very concerned about is mm -hmm. the PMET class, the people who earn 2,400 okay. and above. Right. All right. I feel that you can't, you can't be telling me that Singaporeans are not qualified to do those jobs. I am concerned about foreign workers in low paying jobs in one regard, because many Singaporeans are also competing for those low income jobs. Mm -hmm. and. I would definitely, 
if in government or in parliament, advocate that that Singaporean worker must be given priority for those jobs. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm not talking about jobs that pay five to six hundred dollars a month, which very few Singaporeans can actually afford to do, because they, they simply can't survive with that with that type of wage. Okay. Yeah. So first, you're talking about what kind of jobs? You're talking about PMET jobs. I'm talking about PMET jobs. Okay, but the problem here with low wage migrant workers is not the fact that Singaporeans won't do those jobs, it's the fact that those jobs are not paid uh, commensurate with the kind of work they do, with a living wage, right? Many of those jobs were essential jobs, and yet we're paying, what, $500? Uh, you know, for six hundred dollars to these people to do the really, really important things like garbage collection, you know, to take care of our elderly, to clean our roads, and you've talked about a minimum wage. So first, does the minimum wage apply to those jobs? It should. It should. It should. Okay. And I would put the minimum wage as not less uh, than what the NUS study show that you need at least $1,379 to live on a month. Right. And that must be after deduction of CPF. Right. Right. So the, the minimum wage should at least be, in my estimation, $1,600 to $1,700. All right. So I've heard other parties mention $1,300 and, and all that. That to me is not realistic. Yeah, you, you must have, and I do respect that NUS study, $1,380, and I would take that as the threshold. Okay. So then in that case, right, would Singaporeans then, uh, do you, do you, would you still want to maintain this underclass of low-wage migrant workers? Um, could, could foreigners... Um, well, I mean, once they're, once they're 1,000 or whatever, they wouldn't be low wage. But could foreigners still apply for those jobs fairly if there was a shortage of labor in Singapore? Yes, totally, okay. totally. I think if you have that type of wage for that type of jobs like construction and all that, you may find a lot more Singaporeans actually working in that sector. Yeah. But I don't think that, you know, they, they would be able to fill up all the jobs. Let's, let's be realistic, yeah. Um, so you will still need foreign workers in that regard. But my main concern here, uh, PJ, has mm -hmm. always been the PMED class. Okay. okay. And then in terms of working conditions, um, in terms of, you know, we, we've, it's, it goes far beyond the dormitories, right? Because there's a lot of exploitation, there's a lack of enforcement of rules, right? What's your position on all those things that have this whole I think it is totally disgraceful the way we treat our migrant workers. Okay. I really do. You know, I mean now they sleep twelve to a to, to a to a room, I understand. And Lawrence Wong was uh, saying uh, some weeks ago that yeah they're gonna improve that, it might be ten to a room. To me that is not a lot of improvement. Mm. A Vietnamese friend told me Vietnam, all right, which is supposed to be uh, not even a second world nation. In Vietnam, well, they let's, have... let's not talk down other countries, <laughs> right. okay. okay? Yeah, but yeah, go on, Vietnam. Um, yeah, that, you know, um, the regulations permit only four workers in, in a room, and then they need to have uh, uh, a toilet and communal kitchen for these four people. So it appears that countries like Vietnam are treating their workers better than Singapore, supposedly a first world nation is treating its migrant workers. So I think we need a total revamp of that system there. Okay, so the obvious question then that the PAP will always say is, well, that will lead to higher costs for, higher cost of living, right? Because then we won't be able to afford, for example, our domestic workers, if you pay them a thousand three, a thousand six a month, people won't be able to afford that kind of help. There's cost, high cost of living. Right. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but can you respond to that? I think, I think those are fallacious arguments. All right. I, I, those are fallacious arguments. Just like the PAP has always said that uh, uh, a minimum wage will lead to unemployment. In 1938, when America was still in the depths of its depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt introduced the minimum wage. 
And his famous words were, if you can't afford to pay the minimum wage, you have no business being in business. Right. I would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. The problem in this country is that for the benefit of a certain class who, wants, who want to make huge profits, wages are kept artificially low. Right. All right? And, and then when you try to raise the wages of the lower income, the PAP comes and says, well, if we do that, then you may not be able to afford mates and things like that. The solution Domestic is simple. Workers. You must raise wages. Yeah. You must raise wages. Right. And the only way, and the way to do that is to make sure that you're innovative, creative, so that your productivity goes up. And we have been in a bind. We have basically self-destructed. Because we have relied on cheap labor, it means that we have not moved up the value chain. Right. And I think, you know, as a result, productivity has suffered and our wages have stagnated. So, and I think, well, Lee Kuan Yew and Go Kings, we tried to move up the value chain in the 80s. We remember that. It was a big failure. They made big mistakes. And the PAP has been terribly shy of doing, you know, moving away from our current economic model ever since. Uh, but the other question is about this idea of jobs, which I think I brought it up earlier, PAP is jobs, 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 you're about jobs, but it's, and PMETs, right? The question is though, in this day and age where the idea of a job is drastically changing, 21st century, right? Jobs are not in fixed workplaces and you don't necessarily have even offices anymore. There's a lot of freelancing, what they call the gig economy, Companies can hire workers all over the world to do you know, a job and uh, sort of arbitrage between different uh, costs of livings around, around the world. How do we address that challenge for our, for our economy? Right? Because isn't this sort of concept of a job that the PAP is talking about, and, and from what I'm hearing from you, still one very much fixed in a certain country, a certain workplace, and a certain... Uh, you know, regulatory regime. PJ, uh, yeah. thank you for that. That's a very important question. I still do place a lot of emphasis on the job being uh, something of immense dignity to a person's worth. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do. But I do recognize that we, the world is changing very fast. And you have brought up the gig economy, for example. And so people's working habits and structure will necessarily have to change quite dramatically. And you then have to consider the question of what sort of security can society offer them. And the PAP, Lee Hsien Loong, refused to countenance the possibility. But I think, in all honesty, and COVID has shown this, in all honesty, the world eventually has to move towards universal basic income. I mean, you look at COVID and you look at what happened in the Western world with Britain, you know, giving its citizens money, Australia as well, and you realize at the end of the day, there is no insurance mm -hmm. against unexpected job losses. Mm -hmm. And do you want that person to starve and become unproductive? No. I think it was one of the co-founders of Facebook has even written a book, I can't remember his name now, and he said, look here, universal basic income is the way forward. Mm -hmm. And I know many politicians like Andrew Yang in America has advocated right. for that. That is, the, that is what is going to happen at the end of the day. But I do not know how long it is going to take us to get there. Okay. Fair enough, thank you. Um, another question here uh, from Gabriel Yap. Uh, now, I am not... Uh, totally sure of, uh, maybe you can clarify, he's asking about a writ of summons, but I also understand there is some sort of bankruptcy challenge, and if you, even if you get elected, if you're declared bankrupt, you'll lose your seat. Would you like to comment on, on this? Because, okay, I, 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 I tell you this, um, uh, PJ, that's absolutely rubbish about this, you know, 150,000. That was a historic case which was settled already, okay. you know. Um, and you know, all these allegations about bankruptcy is total rubbish as well. I guarantee you I will never be declared a bankrupt and uh, matters have been resolved. You know, um, it is 
typical of the smearing that goes on, all right, mm. by the IBs and all that, and it always happens on the eve of an election. Right. So, as I said in a post, we'll, we'll see who has the last laugh. Okay. All right. So, last question here from Erin Alicia Fong. Uh, civil society groups in Singapore have been speaking up for marginalized voices for years. What are your plans to address these marginalized groups and what would you do to redistribute wealth in Singapore? I think the second one we've kind of talked about, but uh, can you talk more about what are your plans to address marginalized groups? You see, PJ, um, I am a firm supporter of the civil societies. The problem in this country, because of what it has gone through in the last four to five decades because of the overwhelming majority of the PAP in Parliament, where our constitutional rights have basically been completely adulterated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the changing of the constitution, you know, uh, at their whim and fancy. I want people to be able to speak up and to be able to protest if they want to. We must move away from this notion that if people speak up or protest, it will lead to chaos. Mm. All right? And I think also it is very sad that as a result, our people have been dulled and they do not dare to speak up. And I think it's incredibly sad when you, know, you see a child talking or wanting to voice out something political and the parents you know, shutting him up. And, and looking behind their shoulders, right? You know, or the circular that, email issued by Hua Chong saying, telling pre students precisely, not, yeah, precisely. That is sad. I'm telling you, people do not realize how big a factor that is in a person's creativity and innovation and and the development of the creative faculties. And I think that's where we have lost out. And I think you know that is why despite all the time and the money spent on making our society more entrepreneurial, more risk-taking, we have not succeeded. We have not succeeded. So if I am in government, I'm telling you, I am going to fully restore the rights of the civil societies, the mm -hmm. ability to speak out, to protest. And you know what? I don't want to see the government always winning in the courts. I really don't. Yeah? Because to me, that is an impossibility. If you are a litigation lawyer like myself, mm. if you even have a success rate of 60% in the courts, that is very good, you know? Right. right. Well, yeah, and speaking, of course, we're both men who have been hit with POFMA. We both <laughs> understand some of these challenges. And if you were in government, if these civil society groups wanted to protest against you because they disagree with your rhetoric, you'd be totally cool with that. I'd be totally cool with that. <laughs> you know what I think we should do? I, I mean, I hear a lot, a lot about accountability and transparency yeah. in this campaign. All right. At the end of the day, given the state uh, where we are, you can't have true accountability and transparency unless you do something to the Constitution, unless you make sure that agencies such as CPIB, the election department, you know, maybe the Department of Statistics, are made completely independent of the PMO. And that is something I do address in my manifesto because I want to see that happen. I mean, in the UK, in the US, you have a budget office that is independent of the executive. We must have that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're about out of time now. I I want to thank uh, everyone who wrote in, uh, who, who's watched, who's uh, left questions. Thank you to all of you. And a big thank you to Lin Tian for thank agreeing you, to come here. Uh, I know I, I, uh, probably, I haven't given you an easy interview. I've challenged <laughs> you on a lot of things, and I really respect that you have come here. Uh, the invitation you know, has been open to all politicians, including PAP wants to come here. But not many have shown up so far, so thank you very much. Thank you very for much for giving this. me this opportunity to uh, address Singaporeans and to answer your questions. Right, and all the best to you for the upcoming election. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. So do tune in uh, tomorrow, guys. Will we, Terry, will we have someone tomorrow or uh, not tomorrow sure? Is at okay, so tune in tomorrow, guys, where I'll be back here with someone else uh, for this interview, and uh, we'll be live streaming from uh, this our super secret location in Singapore. 
throughout the rest of the week all the way till election day so thanks very much